Hello, my name is John Sheridan. I'm one of the volunteers at the Wandle Industrial Museum. I'm going to describe an illustrated walk along the course of the River Wandle from Earlsfield to the Thames, focusing on the industrial heritage and the water-powered mills that were once here. Four mill sites on the route are believed to be referenced in the Doomsday Book, dated 1086. Um, I'll illustrate the walk with some images from the Wandle Industrial Museum archive, as well as a few maps and Google Street View screenshots. So we start at Earlsfield Station, originally built in 1884. The entrance shown here and behind it, the lobby, were rebuilt in 2012. Turning right out of the station, we look at Garrett Lane and we can see the railway bridge. Uh, the London and South Western Railway was built in 1838. There was no demand for a station here at that time because the area was not uh, developed. Uh, the bridge was replaced when the station was built and the railway widened in 1884. Uh, the original railway bridge um, also spanned the Surrey Iron Railway, which I'll call the SIR, as well as Garrett Lane. And this is the emblem of the SIR. It was open between 1803 and 1846, and it more or less followed the course of the Wandle from the Thames to Croydon. It was incorporated by an Act of Parliament of 1801. It was a horse-drawn railway on iron rails. A horse could pull a much greater load on the SIR than carts could carry on Garrett Lane which was unpaved in the early 1800s. Um, the SIR transported raw materials and finished goods between the mills and the Thames, and the route included spurs to some of the mills, whose proprietors were SIR shareholders. The emblem evokes allegorical figures, which could be a sign of the confidence of the shareholders in what they would have seen as an age of improvement. I'll say more about the SIR later when we reach it, its wharf near the Thames. So going up Garrett Lane, we reach Pinwith Road here and we turn left. And after a short distance, we come to Pinwith Bridge. Uh, this is from the, the view from the left hand side looking upstream and just out of sight in the distance were the Garrett Mills. The Garrett Mills made gunpowder in the 17th century uh, for the Anglo-Dutch Wars by milling sulphur, saltpetre and charcoal. Later, these mills made linseed oil by milling flax seeds imported from France. Linseed oil was used in paints, varnishes and in leather working, and a byproduct was oil cakes made of pressed seed husks and oil residue and sold as food for farm animals. The mill became a bone mill in the late 19th century. Um, bone dust was mixed with sulfuric acid to make superphosphate of lime a fertilizer. The mill was badly damaged by fire in 1890 and was reported to have been dismantled by 1919. But the last occupants, Wiggins and Pease Limited, remained in business in other premises in the area until well into the 20th century. Here is an older photograph of the same view. Um, this time the railway bridge is visible in the distance. Um, there it is with a train on it. Um, the central barrier here is a mid 20th century construction uh, which was presumably to equalize the flow of water and reduce turbulence and erosion on the bends. There have been occasional floods and flood warnings in uh, recent years from surface water um, after heavy rain. Uh, much of the water is in fact recycled water from the Beddington sewage works. This is the route uh, to the bank of the Wandle uh, from Penwith Bridge, which is just here. Um, so uh, we can see the river snaking through the photograph. Um, so we carry on on Penwith Road 
we turn right onto Dunce Hill Road just before another bridge over the Wandle. We turn left onto Strathfield Road, then right, and then right again to end up um, on the west bank of the Wandle there. And this is the final uh, right turning that we that we take down here to reach the riverbank. Um, so this is uh, the Dunce Hill Mill site. Uh, we are just about here, and in 1841, the mill buildings were present. There, there is a meandering loop which we can see of the river through the meadow, and that was the only channel until early in the 19th century when the straight northbound new cut um, was made to speed up the flow. The flat meadow land uh, was a textile bleaching ground in those days, and the mill here was known to have been a calico printing works between around 1780 and the 1830s. I'll say a little bit about the calico printing process. Uh, it stops with a plain woven cotton textile, unfinished and undyed. It's bleached by washing it in a wood ash solution where the active ingredient is potassium hydroxide, and that is followed by ex exposure to water and sunlight over a number of weeks in uh, the meadowland, which contains parallel water channels, and workers known as Witsters uh, periodically doused the uh, cloth with water. The calico was then printed with coloured patterns and the early process used wood blocks and dyes. Wood block printing originated in East Asia in antiquity. Uh, uh, it was prepared with, the wood was prepared with relief mirror images of the desired pattern. It was inked and brought into a firm, even contact with the cloth. Multiple blocks could be used, inked with different colours. Uh, vegetable dyes were used um, from uh, ground Brazil wood and the madder plant, both of which produced red shades, and wood and indigo produced shades of blue. There are also insect-based dyes from the Kermes or scale insect and the cochineal which both produced um, shades of red. The dyeing processes varied, but typically involved milling or grinding the raw material, boiling it in water, and applying it to the cloth with an alum solution to act as a mordant to fix the dye, and then washing out excess dye. It's fair to say that my description does not do justice to the uh, skills involved. In, in the process. Um, during the 18th century, engraved copper plates were introduced, then copper cylinders were introduced, but wooden blocks continued in use alongside the newer techniques, and indeed wooden blocks were still in use at Merton Abbey Works until the 1950s. There were um, a number of innovators in calico printing in the Wandle Valley, one of the first was Peter Movillian, a Huguenot who opened a mill in the 1690s, and then there was Francis Nixon, John Leach, and William Kilburn. Patterns and finish varied according to use. Um, calico was popular for bed covers, quilts, draperies, and clothing, and also chintz was a glazed calico with a floral pattern. Uh, water power was used in the process in a, in a few ways. For example, to turn calendar rollers for smoothing the cloth, to turn dye mixing paddles, and to turn rinsing spools for washing off excess dye uh, from the cloth in the river. I'll also say a little bit about the history of the calico printing industry. Uh, textile bleaching and dyeing uh, was underway in the Wandle Valley uh, from the 1600s um, and also printed calico and chintz were imported from India by the East India Company, particularly after the restoration of King Charles II in 1660. 
further to lobbying by the woolen industry, the Calico Act 1700 prohibited importation of dyed or printed calicos. So that was an incentive for the development of a domestic industry. But smuggling of printed calico prompted further legislation in 1721 to ban the sale and wearing of many forms of cotton and exceptions included fustian, which was made in England of imported raw cotton, wool and linen. The importation of raw cotton was not prohibited and the Lancashire cotton mills um, uh, uh, lob lobbied for the removal of restrictions on the sale of cotton and they were repealed in 1774. So that was clearly a boost to textile production on the Wandle, which seems to, seems to have developed anyway, despite the restrictions. It's also interesting to note the impact of uh, British protectionism on the development of the domestic industry and the reduction of the role of Indian calico printers. Um, another uh, later view, 20 years later, of the uh, same uh, area. This is Stanford's map. And it's interesting that the site is described here as a printing and starch factory. The printing was, of course, textile printing. Starch uh, was probably made by milling grain in a way that removed the protein and fibre, leaving only the carbohydrate component of the, of the flour, that is the starch. And wet milling was a method that facilitated a starch manufacture together with appropriate sifting and sieving. Uh, flour, ordinary flour, was made by dry milling. Starch powder uh, was used in cooking and laundering and in paper making. It also becomes an adhesive gum uh, when added to hot water. So, so such a gum could have been used in textile printing to stick the carefully positioned uh, textile to a table when block printing took place. The excess dye and the gum would then have been washed off in the river using water-powered rinsing spools. An example of a rinsing spool survives at the Merton Abbey Works in Collier's Wood, which, as the Liberty Works, was the last commercial textile printing works on the Wandle. So this is a, an aerial photo of the uh, new cut route. Uh, so we are we are here. The sawmills uh, that refers to a former use of a converted 19th century building. Other former uses of the Dunce Hill mill site included manufacture of parchment and colour dye and flock. And indeed, there is a flock mill place uh, nearby. Flock making was a form of recycling to make stuffing for furniture and so on. Uh, rags were washed and passed through a breaker, which was a toothed drum revolving at 700 revolutions per minute. The resulting soft wool-like material was then passed through a carding machine and baled for sale. We take the path uh, northwards, uh, northbound on the west, band, west bank of the new cut. A footbridge crosses the Wandle just here, uh, and it goes to the Henry Prince estate, which has a distinctive grid pattern with uh, large arches set into the blocks. It opened in 1938, and its present uh, claim to fame is that Sadiq Khan was brought up there. Between the 1830s and 1929, a so-called cat's meat and chemical manure factory occupied much of the site of the Henry Prince estate. It was a slaughterhouse for what were known unsentimentally as worn out horses. One of the products was horse hide covers for horse drawn carriages. It's possible that they also sent bone to Garrett Mills for milling. 
Anyway, we don't take the footbridge to the Henry Prince estate. Instead, we turn left and then right into Foster's Way. And uh, there's a plaque here to Edward Foster, who won the Victoria Cross in World War I. He was a Wandsworth dustman, and he was promoted on return from the war to inspector of dust carts, a post he held for the rest of his career. We continue on the west bank, and in, in the distance on the left uh, is Southfields Academy. We continue until we reach Kimber Road, and we cross Kimber Road. There was a calico works here uh, from around 1740 to 1812, but no trace of it now remains. We continue on the west bank, there on the other side of the road. Uh, that parkland just to the north of Kimber Road was occupied by a prefab housing estate um, in the post-war years. Uh, we reach the site of Adkins Mill, named after a medieval miller. Um, and to get our bearings, this is a Garrett Lane on the right with rows of houses. And, and this is the River Wandle on, on the left, the, the other vertical uh, uh, line. Um, at that time, 1841, the mill here on plot 414 was uh, Thomas Creswick's paper mill and he advertised himself as playing card maker for royalty. Uh, south of the paper mill had been a calico printing works from the 1740s to the 1830s run by the Plank factory and the meadow here had been a bleaching ground uh, since at least 1657 and a scarlet dye works before it became a calico printing works. Uh, the map here indicates uh, weirs and sluice gates to channel the water under and it, come, it goes under there and comes out uh, in plot 414 and around the mill in a bypass channel and in that way the amount of water going through the water wheel, which was under the mill, um, was controlled. The Calico Works um, closed in the 1830s and a candle and refining oil factory was set up there in its place and that closed and it was incorporated into the expanded paper mill in 1854. So this is a, a, a later map, 20 years later, of the expanded paper mill. Uh, is Stanford's map again. The paper mill was now run by the M Murray brothers who had acquired it in 1854 and had also expanded that year into the premises of the uh, now closed candle and refining oil factory. They named uh, their uh, works the Royal Paper Mills. The Old Sergeant Public House is marked on Garrett Lane and uh, that is still there. The double dotted line here is a footpath um, which is still there and which the walk uh, uh, follows. This is a photograph of the Royal Paper Mills in the late 19th century. And this is the Ordnance Survey map of the Royal Paper Mills uh, at around the same time when it was um, at its zenith, really the, the, the largest state of its development. At the, at the bottom of the map here is Wandle House, which was occupied by James McMurray, and it was demolished in 1928. Uh, the filters and settlers um, here were to purify the river water before it entered the mill. Uh, nowadays, commercial buildings occupy pretty well exactly uh, the, the same area as those filters and settlers, and we uh, walk around them 
uh, to, to the left this um, following the the left hand side of the slide the original paper making process used rags uh, cut up by hand and then torn and macerated by water power revolving machines with blades then boiled and bleached and the resulting watery pulp was lifted onto fine wire meshes and pressed and dried. The McMurrays introduced the use of esparto grass uh, in the 1860s for paper making imported from family estates in Spain and North Africa. The esparto was beaten, boiled in caustic soda, turned to pulp in washers and breakers, bleached with chemicals, beaten and broken again until it was a milky liquid which was fed from vats into machines which made paper in rolls uh, five to eight miles long. The Murrays made different types of paper including newsprint for the Times newspaper. They expanded the business raising capital from the city to invest in new machinery, steam engines and buildings and there uh, is an Esparto street nearby. Unfortunately, a fire destroyed most of the works in 1903 and the firm uh, failed to get on foot again. Uh, the next occupants of the northern part of the site were, were Benham and Sons, manufacturers of cooking ranges and also military ordnance during the two world wars. They vacated in the 1980s and a factory making gas mantles opened on the southern part of the site that was Folk Veritas and they lasted until 1972. They were one of four gas mantle factories in Wandsworth um, at various times. Earlier mills on this site included um, a fulling mill in the 14th century. Fulling was a process to clean and thicken woolen cloth possibly using water-powered pestles to stamp cloth which had been mixed with fuller's earth um, which was um, obtainable in Surrey to absorb greasy material. It was a corn mill from 1589, a copper mill from the 1660s, a water wheel would have driven hammers which beat and shaped copper sheets and craftsmen would have made pots, pans, brewing vessels and other utensils. Um, from 1777 or thereabouts it was an iron mill run by James Henkel and members of the Day family and their products included cannons and shot possibly for the Battle of Trafalgar um, among other uh, uses. Uh, cannon had to be made very accurately and without cracks or distortion otherwise they might have exploded when fired and they were cast in solid form and the barrel of the cannon was bored out with a boring mill, a large rotating iron bar with a cutting head supported on bearings powered by a water wheel moving axially into the cannon along a rack uh, as, it, as it cut out the, the barrel. Um, and an 18th century visitor was very impressed by the, the furnaces in the mill, the melting of the iron and the power of the tilt hammers and observed that the men mingled themselves with the fire like salamanders and the proprietor told him that some of them found it necessary to rehydrate with eight or ten pints of, of porter per day. This would have been good business for the old sergeant pub next door on which the proprietor of the mill held a lease at the time. There's an iron mill road and an iron mill place uh, nearby. Uh, we join the footpath uh, going to the right, this one here, at a polished granite water fountain and this path uh, crosses um, a footbridge over the bypass channel just here um, uh, and goes round the left hand side of the northern part of the mill site 
and joins Garrett Lane. The uh, path emerges uh, on Garrett Lane from these trees. I just mentioned that the level of the water falls quite rapidly in the bypass channel around the uh, mill site and this would have mirrored the fall under the mill as the water passed through the water wheel. The channel upstream of the mill would have been engineered to produce this effect and to increase the uh, water power generated by the water wheel. The uh, mill site is now occupied, not the northern part of it, at least by the big yellow storage facility here. This is the old sergeant, uh, which uh, could be reached by heading southwards down Garrett Lane. However, we head north, not south. And uh, a short walk on Garrett Lane alongside the Wandle takes us to Mapleton Road. The view here is downstream. The Wandle is culverted in the distance under the Wandsworth Southside Shopping Centre, which was completed in 1973 as the Arndale Centre and uh, was the largest in Europe at, the, at that time. Um, small promontory just, just about here was the site of a dye works and this was Thomas Williamson's dye works in the 18th century. It was operated by him and his descendants from the 1730s to the 1830s. And they were scarlet dyers. And indeed, there had been scarlet dyeing here since 1654. The Huguenots brought uh, secret skills when they came to this country as refugees from France in the 17th century. Um, including scarlet dyeing and felt making uh, using the fur of beavers, hares and rabbits. And these skills were combined in the manufacture of high quality Galero hats for Roman Catholic cardinals. Between 1245 and 1965, new cardinals were given a scarlet Galero, which was a wide brimmed tasseled felt hat with a silk lining. Ordinary priests sometimes wore black ones. When cardinals died, their galeros were suspended over their tombs until they crumbled to dust as a symbol of the passing of earthly glory. It was said that the best galeros were made by Huguenots working on the Wandle, which was ironic given that the Huguenots were perse persecuted for their Protestant religion. Subsequent uses of this site from the 1830s were um, a Lucifer match factory run by Richard Bell and his descendants and the manufacture of paints and inks and uh, coloured cement by Cemento Limited until the 1960s. Um, and it then became offices. Um, so we continue on Mapleton Road to reach one of the formal entrances to King George's Park. The park was rapidly renamed from Southfields Park when George V opened it at short notice in 1923. There was a greyhound racing stadium holding 20,000 spectators here between 1933 and 1966. And there's also a storm relief aqueduct crossing the park from the 1880s to the 1960s and also an open-air Lido from 1938 to 1993 on the site of the present uh, recreation centre on the south side of Mapleton Road. We head north along Neville Gill Close, which is uh, this route here, which runs alongside the shopping centre and, and some tower blocks. It's Neville Gill Close was uh, the site of another 19th century new cut for the Wandle. Uh, the park is to the left. The new cut enabled some small meandering scream, streams in the meadow here to be filled in. The park was once a textile bleaching ground. The best known calico printer here was Henry Gardiner 
who was active between 1774 and 1815. At its peak, his business occupied a large part of the present park uh, for bleaching grounds, and he employed 250 staff. He was known for his commemorative printed handkerchiefs and home furnishings for the American market, and some of his designs celebrated American independence. If you Google Henry Gardiner, calico printer, you can see some of his designs online, including an example on the website of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Uh, there is a memorial to Gardner in All Saints Church in Wandsworth High Street. This is Down Lodge, which was built by Henry Gardner. It overlooked his bleaching ground, and uh, we might think it had enabled him to keep tabs on his employees. This is the um, Upper Mills, the um, earliest specific record of a corn mill here was in 1521. The shopping centre now covers the site of the Upper Mills. Uh, building A here was rebuilt with brick in brick in 1818 by Daniel Watney of the Brewing family. It was unfortunately destroyed by fire in 1928. And this is a, a late 19th century, clearly posed photograph of building A and the mill yard. This is uh, the other upper mill building, build, building B. Uh, the weatherboard construction was more typical of mill buildings on the Wandle. The water wheel would have been under the building, and the water for the water wheel would have entered under the arch there. Uh, typically, in mills, the main gearing was on the ground floor, um, and power from the water wheel was transmitted through a revolving vertical shaft up through the building. Uh, the millstones would have been on the first floor, and grain hoppers on the floor above, and uh, other general storage on the floor above that. Uh, flour fell from the uh, millstones down a chute to the ground floor for bagging. This is the same building um, in 1957, uh, when it was no longer in use as a mill. It was demolished in 1962, the last occupants were a firm of cabinet makers. Corn milling or, um, at the upper mills and on the Wandel as a whole ceased shortly after the fire at the other building in 1928. Um, modern roller mills would have rendered this building uneconomic and obsolete. This is the uh, map 1841 showing uh, this area of the upper mill at the at the bottom of the map um, and the middle mill is also visible top right of the map uh, both of them straddling the wandle and we can see that the upper bill comprised the two buildings um, each straddling branches of the wandle uh, plot 436 was the site of Henry Gardner's works. Um, plot 437, uh, we can see if we look carefully, it, it was a reservoir created early in the 19th century after Gardner retired. Uh, we can see that the meadow here in, in this sort of bottom left quadrant of the map uh, uh, it comprises a network of narrow channels, and indeed plot 436 was an island. There's clearly a lot of surface water at that time which suited use as a bleaching ground. Over the last 150 years, both the water table and the amount of water in the Wandle have gone down considerably due to abstraction of the water for domestic and industrial purposes. We can also see on this map, uh, the Ram Brewery, Young's Ram Brewery site, 
on the right hand side and All Saints Church here on Wandsworth High Street. So this is uh, the same sort of area about 50 years on and again we see the upper mills and the middle mill with the wandle linking them and uh, we see weirs and sluice gates to channel the water as well uh, the reservoir is there still and also the northern tip of an ornamental lake that uh, is still there now um, we can see the the channel that is now Neville Gill close between the lake and the reservoir um, and it turns and passes under Buckhold Road and joins the main channel of the Wandle. The Neville Gill close channel was filled in in the late 1960s as part of the redevelopment that saw the demolition of the Greyhound Racing Stadium and the construction of the shopping centre. Buckhold Road has changed course. It now stays on the uh, left of the Wandle um, and joins once with High Street, High Street, just west of the High Street Bridge over the Wandle. So it sort of goes down here like this. On the walk, we turn right at the end of Neville Gilclose into Buckhold Road and make our way to the High Street. We cross the High Street at the crossing close to the bridge over the Wandle. So that is here. This slide again from an Ordnance Survey map focuses on the Ram Brewery site. Uh, breweries are known to have been here since the mid 16th century, originally as a cottage industry attached to the Ram Inn, which is the PH sign there. Uh, Young and Bainbridge, later Young and Co, acquired the brewery and 80 pubs from the widow of George Tritton in 1831. The brewery site expanded northwards during the 19th century, taking over land and buildings, including in 1838. Um, a former dye works on Ram Street, uh, which would have been around here. Uh, Barchard Street is, uh, nearby is named after one of the families that ran the dye works, and they were a notable local family being shareholders in the Surrey Iron Railway, as well as the one Wandsworth Gas Company. Uh, there were fires at the brewery in 1832 and 1882, but each time it was rebuilt on a larger scale. The output was 40,000 barrels a year in, uh, in the 1830s. At that time, the main product was porter, a kind of stout. Pale ales were introduced in the 1860s, and modern bitters developed from that. Water for brewing came from an artesian well until the 1930s. Wandle water was only used for cooling purposes. Um, it, it was circulated through coils in the fermentation vessels uh, to cool the temperature of the, of the fermentation. The Young's Ram trademark was registered in 1893. Young's vacated the site in 2006 when their brewing operation merged with the Wells Company Brewery. The site has been redeveloped as the Ram Quarter. The external walls of many of the old buildings have been retained. The 140 foot tall chimney built in 1908 has also been retained. It was reinforced with iron rings when cracks developed in the brickwork shortly after construction. Sandbrook's brewers now occupy part of the site and commercial brewing has resumed. They're opening a heritage centre where the displays will include two beam engines made by Wentworth and Sons, which were installed in the brewery in 1835 and 1867. 
a couple of other points about this slide compared with the 1890s map a tramway has appeared on Ram Street um, it, this was in fact an electric tram there would already have been a, a, a tram present um, but horse drawn uh, the tramway continued all the way down Garrett Lane second point is that the middle mill is not now shaded so that's this empty uh, box here and that would have been the cartographer's way of uh, telling us that the mill uh, was by then out of use um, having closed in 1898 um, it's we can see that it's weir and sluices were still there this is the ram brewery yard a post photo from the 19th century after crossing Wandsworth High Street, we don't enter the Ram Quarter or cross the river, but we turn left and walk along Wandsworth High Street to All Saints Church, shown here. Now, the church is Great Two listed, and there's been a church on the site since the 13th century. Parts of the present building were built around 1630, but it was mostly rebuilt in 1780 and altered in the 19th century. The church is at the junction with uh, Wandsworth Plain and we turn right and walk down Wandsworth Plain towards Armory Way where there is a pedestrian crossing. The presence of this crossing here is our main reason for taking this route rather than walking through the Ram Quarter. I, I'd suggest um, exploring the Ram Quarter after the walk. There's an, an interesting terrace dating from 1723 on Wandsworth Plain. This is the uh, middle mill, which was set back a little from the right hand side of Wandsworth Plain and was close to the junction with Armory Way. The earliest record of a mill here was in 1504 and it was known as a Brazil mill, uh, grinding Brazil wood for dye until 1605 uh, and from 1605 to 1898 it was a corn mill the windmill supplemented the water mill from around 1750 until the mill was rebuilt around 1770 this Ordnance survey map shows the middle and lower mills there's the lower mill and the middle mill at the bottom uh, and we can see three channels of uh, water on this map uh, the right hand vertical channel here um, was the canal built for the Surrey Iron Railway Wharf and it extended to the back of the ram site um, on this little cut here uh, the left channel is Bell Lane Creek here um, and the centre channel uh, is the Wandle which links the lower and the middle mills and there's the uh, lower mills mill pond uh, the two PH signs just north of the middle mill uh, there were the Crane and Bell, the Bell public houses. The Bell um, has been demolished and its site is now covered by Armory Way. Uh, so we reached, uh, crossing the Arm Armory Way, we reached the Crane pub, uh, which was built in 1738 and it's said to be haunted. Um, it was called the Armory when this picture was taken and indeed it was known for a while by that name but it was originally the, the crane and is now the crane again a plaque on the wall um, can't quite see it from here but it's somewhere around here uh, describes some of its history um, it's a possibility for post walk refreshments the walk follows the causeway which is the left turn uh, just on the far side of the pub 
and just before the uh, Armory Way bridge over the Wandle. The causeway runs alongside the Wandle and was formerly home to various industries and workshops, including a bolting cloth factory making special fabrics for sifting and sieving flour. Uh, the walk also passes under the railway viaduct. This um, is the Windsor Line, which opened in 1846. It branched off from the London and South Western Railway at Clapham, Jun Clapham Junction. The viaduct is 1100 feet long and has 22 arches. Um, this is the lower mill near the mouth of the Wandle, as is that one from a different angle, both charcoal uh, sketches. A plaque now marks the site of the mill and um, it's, it, it's, uh, there's a bridge there. Uh, which from which the mouth of the Wandle and the Thames are visible. There's also um, a natural feature known as the spit, which is worth exploring. The lower mill was a partly tidal mill, first recorded in 1371 and probably in use before then. It was in continuous use until demolition in 1898. It produced mainly corn with a period of linseed oil production um, in the 18th century. It was rebuilt many times, including at least twice after fires. Um, in the 19th century, it had 12 pairs of millstones, four foot in diameter, driven by three water wheels, equal to 60 horsepower. So this is um, an Auden survey map showing the uh, lower mill the bottom centre and the mouth of the Wandle. Um, there were also waterworks here and gasworks. This was this was the gasworks, which were on the site uh, from 1834 to 1971, uh, the year in which natural gas replaced coal gas. Um, the coal from which the gas was made came from Newcastle on coastal collier ships and three successive colliers were named the SS Wandle between 1909 and 1959. And the first of these survived an, in, an encounter with a U-boat in World War I. Young's was one of the first uh, buildings in Wandsworth to be supplied with gas lighting from the gasworks in 1835. Electricity was installed in Young's Brewery in 1896. This is a, a, a much older uh, map from the mid 18th century, um, which shows the lower here, the middle here, and the upper mills, all on, all on the same map and all straddling the river. All three were owned by the Watney Brewing family for a period in the 19th century and then by the Aerated Brett Company, and then by George Pym and Company, who made a product called the Wando Loaf. Uh, we can also see uh, a place that they call Wandsworth Island, where corn was grown, and the, uh, the delta, if you like, of the uh, Wandle. To the left-hand side would have been osier beds, for the cultivation of willow for baskets and fish traps. And here is Stanford's map of a similar view, uh, clearer because the waterways are in colour. And you can see a good view of the Surrey Industrial Railway Canal with its lock gate and the cut going to the back of the Young's Brewery. Uh, Young's used the, the cut for the delivery of coal and malt and also for sending barrels and bottles of beer to Young's pumps across the river. The gas company filled in the canal in 1932 so the cut had to go as well. Uh, the lower and middle mills are also visible um, 
on this map as a middle mill, uh, described as flower mills. Um, we also see a reference to osier beds here. And um, gas holders, you see gas holders. And the feathers in here, and that is now, that area is, is, has been now recently referred to by developers as Feathers Wharf. So here's a photograph of the mouth of the Wandel with the north bank of the Thames in the distance. Uh, I, th I think this was possibly taken in the 1980s. Uh, plaques re uh, regarding the Surrey in the, uh, Iron Railway and stone sleepers uh, are set in walls. There's uh, examples of the stone railway sleepers. Um, they're set into walls of buildings in the Ram Quarter. The sleepers were square so that the horses pulling the wagons could walk on the gravel between them. Um, and this is um, a painting of the SIR wharf and we can see on it uh, tracks, wagons, cranes. Uh, the wharf uh, was the bank of the short canal that had been dug to the east of the mouth of the Wandle. Um, it was used to load and unload the raw materials and finished products between uh, the SIR wagons and Thames barges. The SIR was one of the first railways in the world coming into operation in 1803, as I mentioned before. And it ran uh, between the mouth of the Wandle and Croydon. Uh, the original shareholders included Richard Bush of the Lower Mill, George Tritton, of the Ram Brewery and Florence Young, whose son Charles later took over the brewery. A second line was added to the SIR in 1805, extending the route to the uh, Merstham Chalk and Limestone quarries. There had originally been a more ambitious plan to build a railway between Portsmouth and the Thames to transport naval ordnance for the war with France, but that line was not built and was no longer seen as necessary after the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. The SIR more or less followed the course of the Wandle, Garrett Lane, Collierswood, Mitcham, Croydon. It was built by Benjamin Outram, who's, from whose name the word tram is derived, and the present tram route between Mitcham and Croydon follows part of the route of the of the um, SIR. The SIR was superseded by the development of steam power and also probably by improvement in the condition of Garrett Lane. Uh, Garrett Lane became a toll road uh, with turnpikes around 1800 and that enabled the cost of road maintenance to be shared by the parish and travellers who were passing through. So at first maintenance would have comprise smoothing out ruts and replenishing the surface with materials such as straw, stones and rubble, and repairing drainage ditches and watering the road in the summer to reduce dust. Later from the 1820s, John Loudon McAdams' method of macadamisation was gradually introduced to the national road system. Uh, roads were surfaced with a layer of small angular stones which became compacted with use and would have, would have allowed heavy carts to travel much more easily uh, than the earlier um, earth and rubble roads. The SIR went into decline and closed in 1846. In truth, it had never been a success. Uh, the volume of traffic and therefore revenues were too low. The rails were made of cast iron rather than wrought iron. They broke too frequently and repairs used up the profits. Uh, later in the 19th century, James McMurray of the Royal Paper Mills owned the wharf and used it to land esparto, grass and coal from the 
Thames for his mill. Uh, later, the canal was owned by the gasworks, which uh, used it to take delivery of coal before it acquired the Thames frontage in 1906. Um, and, and after that, after 1906, the colliers delivered coal directly uh, to pontoons um, in the Thames uh, using steam cranes and, and into the gasworks. As mentioned before, the canal was filled in in 1932 and Armory Way was built shortly afterwards. So a few final points. The water mill sites in Battersea and uh, Wandsworth believed to have been referenced in the Doomsday Book are the Lower, Middle, Upper and Atkins mill sites. The Doomsday Book did, didn't give precise locations, but the Wandle was the only suitable river in the area for mills, and these are the um, oldest ones. The sites are very unlikely to have changed. The Wandle was well adapted for mills uh, as being a chalk stream with a rapid fall. It was not nav navigable and has never been known to be to have been frozen. And it was the most heavily worked river in London in the 18th and 19th centuries. A wide variety of products were made um, in the mills, um, corn milling originally, of course, and then gunpowder, paper, copper, utensils, iron, textiles linseed oil and more. Um, the Wandle became polluted and attracted the um, attention of conservationists from the 19th century. Um, uh, um, water power was superseded by steam and electricity um, and also the old processes were superseded. So roller mills superseded millstones chemical bleaching replaced bleaching grounds and synthetic dyes replaced vegetable dyes. There were many business failures and also a lot of innovation and adaptation to changing circumstances and changes of products and rebuildings of mills over time. Some of the successful buildings were family dynasties passing on skills and business contacts and moving and expanding with the times. Some successful millers were able to buy the freeholds of their sites, eliminating rent taking. Um, if you do this walk, I suggest retracing your steps from the mouth of the Wandle uh, to look around the re redeveloped ram site. Finally, I hope this has been of some interest and might stimulate some further research. And thank you for watching and listening.